So it's a, a pleasure. Miriam, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, this is a uh, uh, going to be a very interesting evening in terms of, I, th I think, you know, what you've dedicated your professional life to, to the uh, organization on NFOCO. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. <laughs> I know Jaime would say it much better than I would. Um, which is here in, an, in New York, a, a national nonprofit organization that supports a wide variety of photographers with a Latino, African, Asian, Native American heritages. And I think that's so important to give a greater diversity of people the, um, the opportunity to exhibit, have their work seen, but also to support each other as a community. Because I've heard from Jaime how supportive that organization has been for him. So I think that's really, really important. Um, but Miriam, in her own right, is also a talented photographer. And her work has been exhibited in numerous museums and galleries throughout the United States and abroad. Most recently, at the uh, El Thaler Latino Americano Gallery in 2012. And this entire sheet is covered with exhibitions, <laughs> publications, awards. And um, the evening today, Miriam's going to be talking about <coughs> Foco and why you know, being part of a community is so important, especially in when you're trying to work creatively. And I really think that's a great service that you offer. Thanks. Okay. Showtime? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now I will be blinded. Oh. All righty. Um, well, thank you very much, and all of you that have trudged through the ickiness outside to be here tonight. Um, Katrin mentioned it's going to be an interesting night. I'm not sure how interesting I can make it, but, um, but I'll do my best. Um, I wanted to start out with um, how I got started, how I got started with Infoco. Um, I was, oh, all right, I'm not going to guess your ages, but I was in college, and this was a long, long time ago. Um, and a colleague and I were wondering why we never learned about somebody other than dead male white artists. And we posed that question and we got um, answers that we weren't happy with, that we just not, we weren't happy with, it just perplexed us. Like, why can't... Keep going, I just want to make sure this is... <laughs> okay. One. Keep going. Um, you know, why can't we learn more? Why is there only a single narrative? Why can't we have access to other voices, other ideas that come from a variety of, of cultures? And uh, some of the answers we got is like, well, there really aren't many photographers of color anyway, so oh well. And then another answer we got was, um, you know, every, you know, it, educators will know this. Everybody is so overworked, and if the school isn't supportive or you don't have the resources to get um, more or diverse voices or artists to come in and speak, um, it, you don't, you know, you lack the access. And um, that's, that's what got us thinking. And we put together an exhibition, and we decided we we're just going to start making phone calls. And we uh, ended up creating uh, a huge exhibition that ended up traveling around um, to various centers. And um, it was an even exhibition at Yankee Stadium for five years. Uh, photograph it's called Fire Without Gold, uh, Photographers of Color. And we had you know, some really great people just participating that we just cold called, basically. We're like, hi, uh, we're these two students, and do you want to be in this show? And, and everybody said yes. I mean, it was amazingly supportive. So. <laughs> Um, and uh, Marilyn Nance, who just walked in, might remember those days. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it takes motivation, right? It takes a curiosity. It takes uh, a little bit of moxie and elbow grease. And you can make amazing things happen. But you got to be curious about the world. And you have to not kind of accept what is just placed in front of you. If you want more, go find it. So. And that's how I found out about Enfoco, was actually through that <coughs> exhibition um, process as an undergrad. So it started out, Enfoco, as just a group of guys, and literally it was mostly guys, um, 
that were just sitting around in their living rooms and, and got tired of just complaining all the time of why they can't get access to these jobs, these photo shoots, these exhibitions, why they're not getting their work seen. And they decided to make a difference. So the other spin of this is the images that were often being shown in the media and in the arts were very one-sided. It was mostly sensationalist, and you know, sometimes that could still be said today, um, but it just didn't portray like urban communities, right? These are photographers in New York City. Uh, their communities with pride and dignity. It was always the violence, it was always the poverty, it was always the despair. And, and that's not how they lived their lives. And they wanted something that was a little bit more holistic and representative. So that's how it started. And then uh, by 74, it became an actual nonprofit. And uh, by 78, uh, at first, when it was just Latino photography uh, photographers, by 78, it, then it stepped up to become inclusive of uh, other photographers that were experiencing the same lack of access to opportunities. And um, this is one of Enfoco's very first exhibitions. It also believed very strongly and still does that art belongs in more places than just a museum or gallery. So if these communities need to see artwork by artists or the subjects of the imagery, um, they want to see their stories reflected, their faces, so we just set up in the park. Um, and it had a lot of uh, street galleries uh, events throughout the years. And uh, it was very focused also on education as well. So um, giving youth an opportunity to also tell their own stories and document their own communities in a way that they might find relevant or meaningful or um, you know, more important. And uh, we've started digging through our archives recently and came up with like a little treasure trove of these uh, press releases that actually have the photographs glued onto the paper. It's like, ah, oh, the old days. And uh, this was a program that Enfoco had with the uh, <coughs> Museum of Natural History, which is kind of neat to look back and find out that history. Uh, another photography workshop in 79. <clears throat> and uh, these photographs of the Enfoco Street Gallery uh, were taken by David Gonzalez, who is a reporter with the New York Times. He, um, in 79, he had just graduated from Yale, of all places, and he had to come home and tell his parents, I think I want to be a photographer, <laughs> which, you know, they didn't take very uh, kindly to. It was hard to explain, but um, he had his start in uh, working with community and photography within <coughs> FOCO. So some of these are his images um, from those times. And the street gallery, which started so many years ago, I mean, in FOCO is almost 40 years old now, um, is now known as the Touring Gallery uh, Program. So we're still <coughs> doing it, but we've brought it you know, mostly indoors, um, alternative spaces as well as galleries. One of the things that um, David Gonzalez mentions and credits and FOCO with is that it was able to create a space that, in his words, allowed us to be called photographers when we couldn't even get our parents to approve. And that was a pretty radical departure back then. For a lot of Puerto Rican working class in New York City, it was a crazy idea. Charlie, who was in FOCO's founder, Charlie made it okay, and you didn't have to lose where you came from. By sheer force of will, Charlie made it happen, and Foco had no money, but we had the dream. And um, you know, again, moxie and elbow grease. <laughs> By 84, um, still faced with not being able to get into magazines or have their work shown and represented, uh, the 
photographers decided, of Enfoco decided to create their own magazine. And uh, so in 84, 85, Nueva Luz was created. And um, it still holds fairly true to its original layout, um, where the, the images are, are displayed almost as if it's a gallery. Uh, plenty of white space around it. They have room to breathe. You can look at the images and actually absorb it and think through. So it's not a lot of graphics. It's not a ton of adver advertising. This is truly about the artwork itself and the artists. Um, and I did bring some with me, so if anybody's interested, come talk afterwards. Um, <clears throat> it has shrunk down in size throughout the years, but it's still, uh, it's still distributed. It still features photographers of various cultures. And we make sure that it gets into the hands, not just of you know, public schools, libraries, um, community organizations, mostly throughout the city, because it's easy for us to distribute. Um, educators, if educators want them, we're happy to give a stack as long as they pay for shipping. Um, and, but also get it into the hands of curators. We have so many folks and arts administrators that come to us saying, if this didn't exist, I would not know who the, who the photographers are. We just, they, you know, there is still a lack of access out there even for the folks that are higher up that, you know, one would imagine they're very knowledgeable. Well, everybody's knowledgeable, but, you know, how broad is that definition? So, <clears throat> there we have it. And as part of uh, Nueva Luz, this was one from, from one of the early essays that I pulled out, because I think, I think it still um, talks to the idea of the photo industry today. You know, that certain, in order to succeed, there's this idea that artwork has to look a certain way or feel a certain way or it has to be lit a certain way. And um, there's a compromise at some point, right? Some people call it selling out. Other people will call it just, well, trying to make a living. And it just, it depends where you are as an artist, what you're willing to give up or not. Can you hold fast to your individuality and your beliefs and your vision? Like, no matter what support you get, if any, um, can you do that? So this is something that uh, you know, we've been discussing recently through various exhibitions and uh, uh, a talk recently at, at Photo Expo as well. Uh, with the, through the 80s now, uh, you know, soon after Nueva Luz came out, we published a, uh, uh, an issue that featured a Brazilian photographer that had nudes of parents with their children. <gasps> So <clears throat> I'm sure none of you could mention another photographer that did nudes of their children. Anyone? Yeah, no. Okay. So, well, the interesting part is um, recently I came across uh, actual text where Nueva Luz is mentioned uh, by Jesse Helms in The Culture Wars. And um, yeah, some of you might be too young to remember those times, but it was, uh, you know, it, it became pornography, that uh, there's public funds being used to promote pornography, not art, not a particular vision. Um, and uh, this, is, this is one of the pieces we published, by the way. So um, it, cr it created a huge, huge uh, issue because you know, all of a sudden all the politicians are going, oh my gosh, we need to pull the funding, but the support from the art community was so great. Luckily, we, and Foco got so much publicity <laughs> that things actually became a little bit better. Uh, magazines you know, are not exactly affordable to print, um, but the support for what we were doing and what we stood for uh, remained even stronger after all that. So, um, you know, the, this is, yeah, another, another one from, from our archives uh, press release. So one of the things that uh, Charles mentions here is, uh, 
you know, the, the danger of letting go of your identity is uh, to acquiesce the sense of oneself for an imposing, synthetic, two-dimensional fantasy projected on a TV screen. Um, and that's, that's something that he always led people to want to be true to themselves and not, you know, follow like little lemmings what uh, the art world is reflecting. So heading towards its 40th anniversary, we've exhibited over 300 different artists, uh, probably close to 200 exhibitions, and uh, 66, no, actually probably 70 writers now uh, in Nueva Luz, and uh, 52 issues of Nueva Luz. It is, um, it's important to have your work published. You know, it's, it's a record for posterity. Exhibitions, they go up, they go, and, and that co cultural consciousness <coughs> gets lost because it's not a tangible object that stays in time. And of course, history is going to be dictated by whoever is the one speaking it. So here we are. We are speaking it with Nueva Luz. Uh, so, you gonna keep me posted with time? Okay, all right. Um, and earlier this year, we had an exhibition of uh, a few artists that have been published in Nueva Luz throughout the years, uh, and they created these stands so we could display every single issue that was published. And it was really exciting to see people just go through this amazing legacy of imagery. Ana de Orbegoso is uh, one of our artists, um, and I brought I brought a series of uh, images by artists. If you have questions about anything in particular, um, feel free to ask. But I just wanted to be able to show the <coughs> a diversity of types of imagery as well. Um, <clears throat> Since Enfoco started, it also created a permanent collection. And it started very informally. You know, they would have a show. Um, the artists would say, yeah, well, why don't you keep some? You know, hold on to it. OK. And next thing you know, the next artist is saying, yeah, do you want a piece? OK, sure. And next thing you know, um, there are boxes and boxes of prints in a back room that uh, hadn't really been tended to with the idea, looking to the future of creating a permanent collection. In speaking to, with one of the other founders, he's like, yeah, back then we, we weren't thinking about history. We were just, you know, we were just hanging out, having fun, trying to shoot some great pictures. Right? You don't know what you're doing now, how 20 years, 30 years, 40 years <coughs> down the road, looking back, what that's going to be like. So about uh, 15 years ago, we started with the idea of, you know, there's a lot of images here that nobody has ever laid eyes on, other than when it was originally published or exhibited, of course. But you put that all together, you have an amazing context. You have a look at history that isn't in most museums or galleries. Um, and it's, a, it's amazing, amazing access. Uh, in 2011, last year, um, we managed to, well, a couple years ago, we managed to get funding from the National Endowment for the Arts to create a traveling exhibition of the collection, um, a selection of it, not the whole thing. Uh, we have over 700 images in the collection now. The exhibition has about 56 pieces by 48 different artists. And I do not envy the curator's job, who was Elizabeth Ferrer, to trim it down with so many talented voices out there, to trim it down to 56 pieces. And um, if I can quote one of the things that she said about it, about the importance of the collection, um, it's extremely valuable because it's made up of highly accomplished, innovative work, by, innovative work by photographers who remain largely absent from the canon. 
And from canon, I mean standard published histories of photography, major museum surveys, and significant public collections. These photographers bring issues to the table that others might wish to overlook, and they significantly broaden the scope of contemporary art and image making. In fact, in my mind, this collection reveals a parallel history of photography from nearly the last half century, perhaps one that is incomplete, but that is tantalizing in its suggestion of a broader history than has been largely presented so far by museums, curators, and historians. Anybody here planning on being a curator? Is a curator? Historian? Photographer? <laughs> OK, just checking. <laughs> Good. All these things are needed. All these things are needed. So, um, you know, again, opening, this is like going to a candy store, opening up these boxes of photographs and finding <coughs> these absolute gems of history, uh, putting it together, figuring out, OK, how are we going to frame it? How are we going to present it? Um, what's going to be paired next to what? How is the exhibition going to flow? You've planned your own exhibitions, though, right? OK. So you know, how do you, do you do it chronologically? Do you do it thematically? There are so many choices. And um, the exhibition ended up going into three separate phases. Um, and it's a little bit of a timeline. The, that works from the 70s are very uh, documentary-based because, you know, coming out of the civil rights movement and all the things that happened in the late 60s and what the photographers were focusing on and how they wanted to document <coughs> their own stories and communities with dignity, there, uh, most of the work is documentary. Um, and then it progresses through the years and um, and then most recently, uh, we see imagery that is a little bit more <coughs> global, not just in its content, but in uh, blurring boundaries of photography as well. More collages, more um, digital compositions. Uh, the exhibition uh, was in Algeria in Newark this past summer. And uh, it's going to be on its way to San Francisco later this week to open there in January. And we're hoping it'll do a bounce down to LA. And who knows where else it'll go next, but uh, we hope it'll keep traveling. And uh, this, each portion of the show comes with the accompanying text panel to give a little bit of that sense of history and where the photographers are. Uh, Dulce Pinzon has an exhibition, I think, at Columbia happening right now. Anybody know? I think so. She filmed the whole film, if you remember. Yeah? Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, Dulce, we published her work and we exhibited her in a show at Aperture uh, a couple years ago. Um, and the series speaks to uh, folks from Mexico that, you know, come here to try and make a living, but also to be able to send money home. So each of the images comes with a caption. This one, for example, uh, Minerva Valencia from the state of Puebla works as a nanny in New York. She sends home $400 a week. And this is called The Real Story of the Superhero Series. Uh, she shot this after, um, after thinking about you know, how especially in, in the idea in New York where uh, who gets labeled as a superhero, you know, certainly firefighters, policemen, 
And she's like, there are so many other folks that are working their butts off um, and are heroes to their own families. Um, and uh, she wanted to pay tribute to them. Samantha Box um, w was one of our New Works Photography Fellowship Award winners. And she shot this, uh, she has an amazing documentary about the LGBT homeless youth here in New York. Really powerful work. And um, she was recently shown at the Open Society as well. And, uh, is getting the word out there to support uh, these teenagers. Anu Matthew um, was one of the first winners of our uh, New Works Photography Awards. And um, interviewing her about 10 years afterwards, she said that Infoco was one of the first places that took her work seriously, um, which is so powerful to hear because you're just thinking, oh, great, talented, good work, you know, let's give them a show. And then you find out a decade later that it was pivotal to their, to their career. And um, we just keep doing what we do. We, you know, we see talent, we see stories that may need to be told, and, uh, and we try to get it out there the best way we can. Uh, Karen Miranda Riva de Neira uh, was also a New Works Fellow a couple of years ago. Uh, we exhibited her work at Calumet. And she is in an upcoming exhibition at uh, Brick Rotunda Gallery. Uh, with this series, Other Stories, where she recreates memories of her childhood uh, with her family. Like her family are all game for reenacting these things. Uh, and this, in case you can't read it, is uh, Mom Curing Me from the Evil Eye, circa 1990. So the egg over her uh, temple. Tia Margarita showing me how the traditional yuca bread is made from 1991. My mom thanking the rain and Maria worrying that I might get sick. <laughs> Gabriel relocating my grandfather's chandelier due to the earthquake that took place the same day the conflict with Peru started. 1995. My mom braiding my hair like her mother did to her, circa 1990. Mm -hmm. Don Gregorio Anton uh, is also in the upcoming show at Brick Rotunda Gallery. And um, these pieces are Film, oh, let me go back here. It's a film that is basically melted onto copper, and he does some kind of magic with it and distresses it and paints it, and, uh, and then hand writes these incredibly powerful sayings along, along the bottom of it. It's very spiritual work um, and definitely worth seeing. They're, they're very small. It's actually a piece of copper, and uh, they're reminiscent of a Mexican tradition also. What are they called? Um, it'll come to me. <laughs> this is before he got into working with images on copper, um, still creating the, making the unseen seen in a way.
Uh, Chuy Benitez has uh, photographed extensively in Houston. The series is called Houston Cultura. Um, Houston is predominantly a Latino town. And what he's done, uh, in his own words, is take several decisive moments and stitch them all together. So uh, using a large format camera, he creates these amazing panoramas um, from just people's lives. Uh, Gerald Cyrus, who was a speaker here, was it earlier this year? Yes, okay. <laughs> I'm not used to thinking in semesters anymore. <laughs> okay. Gruana Melendez, a lot of these uh, photographers are also local. And uh, Gruana is another artist that has extensively photographed her family both in uh, Dominican Republic and here in New York City. And Dawood Bay was featured in a very early issue of Nueva Luz and also wrote for it. Um, has anybody familiar with his blog? Yeah, okay. Those of you that aren't, your homework is check out Dawood Bay's blog. Uh, Ana de Orbegoso. She has taken um, religious paintings <coughs> in Peru uh, from the colonial era and has inserted the indigenous populations as the Virgin Marys and the Virgin of this and that and the other. So kind of reclaiming, uh, reclaiming the land, reclaiming art, reclaiming everything, heritage. Ricky Flores is a photographer, Bronx photographer. Uh, he works with Gannett now and he's part along with David Gonzalez uh, Angel Franco uh, from the New York Times, who have come together to create a, a, an exhibition, I assume one day a book, about um, another side of the South Bronx in the 70s and 80s. And um, those of you that you know have heard the Bronx is burning um, from from those days, you know again it was things you would see in the media is despair, poverty, abandoned lots, you know, people doing drugs, violence, and um, they were there for it. It was their homes, their communities. It was, was it gritty? Well, hell yeah, but life isn't just that. It's not just one facet. So uh, they have an exhibition coming up at the Bronx Documentary Center. Uh, which is in the South Bronx. I encourage everybody to go there. They have film screenings at least once a month, really amazing artist talks um, and exhibitions. So uh, their group now for this show is called Seis del Sur, and it's six guys, uh, six photographers from the Bronx uh, that are kind of reclaiming history. The uh, caption of this one is the uh, dispatch saying, is there a fire over there? Rochelle was part of the series too, right? A few weeks ago. Yeah. A few weeks ago. Oh, yeah, we're, excellent. We're, we're trying. <laughs> it's all any of us can do. 
Did anybody see her talk? Yeah. Do they make you come to these things? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. That's okay. Good, good, good. Exposures. Take advantage of it while you can. Do I need to show Jaime's work, or is this redundant? It's nice to see. Good to yeah. see. We are so proud of him. I remember when he, uh, we had a portfolio review session. We do, we do a huge portfolio review session. Um, we're probably going to have the next one coming up in the spring. Uh, 20 different curators, editors, uh, arts professionals come in, and uh, photographers get, you know, their 20-minute slot, one-on-one, -on -one personal attention uh, with these folks. And uh, Jaime had brought this portfolio, which I hadn't seen yet. And at the end of the review, it was like aperture, light work, um, like, like five other curators were all, hover I should have brought that photo for the presentation, were all hovering around the table, like going through these prints. Um, and it was, it's just so exciting to know that the reason he's not here is because he's publishing this book. So it makes me very happy. And uh, we also published Jaime's work in Nueva Luz uh, uh, several issues ago. And he was part of our touring gallery program last year, too. Or was it this year? I'm not sure where the time goes. Um, and this is, uh, I wanted to bring up a couple of the thoughts because this ties in so much to what Enfoco does and represents. Uh, this was part of a panel that, uh, that we were honored to be a part of at Photo Expo. And um, it's really, in some ways, incredibly frustrating to still be having the conversation about lack of representation and access. And on the other hand, if there aren't people still talking about it, the assumption is that, well, yeah, it is what it is. And it's, you know, there must only be certain types of art shown. And uh, that's the way it is. But uh, one of the things that came out of that panel, um, and all the panelists did, you know, a bit of research to come, you know, to, to find these statistics. Um, and it's still kind of sobering. So this isn't 40 years ago. This isn't, you know, 20 something years ago when I was in college. Um, this is, you know, this is now. This is still, still happening. And for those of you that are wondering how to get your own projects funded and exhibited and what goes into that, um, <coughs> the amount of funding allocation to institutions and museums is pretty sobering. Uh, major museums, right, budgets over five mil get the majority of arts funding that is out there, leaving everybody else just kind of scrambling for, for the rest. Um, So I, I pulled some, you know, information from various uh, papers and sources and census and Committee for Responsive Philanthropy. But the demographics of the country are changing greatly. One of the things that we discussed at the panel is, well, A, should art be blind? And, well, if it should, how on earth could it be? Because we all have our own filters that we see things through. Um, but the other thought is, if the majority of art at museums <coughs> caters to a particular population, as the demographics of the population changes, who's going to be going to the museums? Right. So this was an interesting statistic on the changing face of America. 
and how museums are worried, literally worried about audience and who's attending and you know their need, it's a little bit of a wake up call, their need to diversify their what they their holdings and what they show. You know, it'd be great if they keep diversifying their staff and the gatekeepers and the people that, you know, have a broader look at what's happening. Um, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this. I know January probably seems really far away, um, but it's, it's fun for us to see the artists that came through our New Works program and how they've evolved, how their work has evolved and changed, and how they're being shown at, at other venues. Um, and this show is, has several photographers that have really taken the medium of photography and, and pushed it. Uh, Colette Fu works with pop-up books. She creates these insanely intricate, I don't know how she has the patience to do it, but insanely intricate pop-up books from her own photographs. Um, as an example, Don Anton is in the show, um, and uh, Karen Miranda Rivadeneda, uh, Wendell White, um, and a few other photographers. I want to leave uh, time for questions, so um, we just have a few more things here, just to give you an idea of what Infoc was offering today, and uh, the Turing Gallery exhibitions, the New Works Photography Fellowships, uh, every once in a while we do a members exhibition. We have Nueva Luz. Um, if anybody is interested, at, online we don't, uh, we don't advertise a student rate, but if anybody's interested in subscribing, let me know and <coughs> we'll work something out for you. Uh, we do professional development workshops for free. Um, so if you know you need feedback or uh, you know you're interested in finding out what we have going on, um, I know you have <coughs> being part of SVA, you have great access to some of our workshops. We did one with SVA, which was so fantastic with Mary Virginia Swanson and how to really push your work and and market it uh, to new audiences and you know get your stuff together. We have one coming up called Minimize the Pain, Digital Workflow Solutions for Photographers. Uh, we have one coming up, uh, Foot in the Door, like how can you get your foot in the door? What do I need to do with my portfolio? How can I maybe command a little bit of attention? Um, and uh, have our New Works Photography Fellowship exhibition coming up in the spring as well. So if anybody's interested, everything is always on our website. Um, if you're interested in submitting work, you can go to our home page and follow the link for our programs. Uh, member benefit is one-on-one -on -one portfolio review. So, and uh, follow us. Thank you. <laughs> All right, who's got questions? I think it depends where you're at. Like, what, what are your particular needs, right? Do you need to know what your next step is? Come in for a portfolio review. Uh, if I know for a lot of folks, it's kind of, you know, going up to the Bronx isn't necessarily an easy trek, especially if, <clears throat> whether you're in school or you work a day job or whatever. But, you know, maybe we can arrange a Skype call. Um, or something along those lines, right? 
but it's, I mean, it's not exactly a blanket answer because people need different things, so, you know, we, we try to help. Uh, we have a list of resources of other arts organizations and, and activities, um, but, you know, it's, I think as a photographer, it's definitely important to get your work seen by as many people as possible. And regardless of whether it's just feedback, you know, whether it's, you know, artistic or technical feedback, or where do I go with this next, right? That's important too. Or, or just a, a new idea, right? If, if it's not something, um, you know, we do, Nuova Luz publishes three photographers per issue. I mean, it, it's, you know, so we have, needless to say, a backlog of folks that we would love to publish. Same with the exhibitions. We do four touring gallery exhibitions a year, um, and then the New Works exhibition, um, we have an outside juror come in to, uh, for it. It's a massive undertaking, but again, that's only two winners and three honorable mentions. So we can only do very concrete things for artists X amount of times a year, right? But we're at other portfolio reviews, we're at conferences, we're meeting with other curators, right? So sometimes I'll see something and go, well, it's not something that fits into what we're doing, but how about I know this other place that might be interested in your work, or this curator is, is looking for photographers that are working with this particular topic, right? So, and I'm not saying that just for us, but when you have an opportunity to meet with somebody, don't assume that because they just didn't give you a show, right, because that's kind of hard to do, that it, it might still lead to something. It just might not be immediate, right? So think of it as like planting seeds um, and just get your work seen by as many people as you can. Yeah. Be courteously persistent. How's that? So I'm interested in what you uh, uh, just touched upon a little bit is the idea of being uh, of having the label. I mean, you don't see uh, like a Richard Averdon walking around going, "I'm a dead white man." Because <laughs> well, he's you know not what I mean. dead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, or somebody I know what you mean. Sa saying that. Sure. And, like recently, I was invited to be on a panel of uh, female photographers, and it's like it makes you sort of wonder, like, what do you think I'm taking my photos with? You know, it's and so the labels I can understand. They, they seem to cut both ways. They do, yeah. And so could you like, address that a little bit more? Yeah, uh, sure. Well, it, it's, you want to be known as a, as a photographer, as an artist. You want validation for your work regardless. And I think that all artists seek that, you know, whether no matter ethnicity, nationality, or gender. Um, it's important to have that recognition in a way. Um, we have several artists that you know, have said, you know, we would prefer, you know, <laughs> we would love to publish you. Well, yeah, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be labeled. So there are, there are artists that feel that way. They feel very strongly that the only way they can communicate with the mainstream art world is by, you know, becoming neutral, gender neutral, ethnicity neutral, color neutral. So, um, it's a matter of preference, you know, like everybody has a voice, but everybody, you know, deserves to be seen the way they want to. And, and I agree, you know, like we get a lot of calls around September, October, because somebody wants to do a show for Hispanic Heritage Month. <laughs> it's like, call me in, you know, June <laughs> for some other month. You know, and the same thing for Women's History Month, Black History Month, you know, like we get all these calls. And we go out of our way to say, you know, we would love to do a show, but can we have another time slot? Because it, it is important. And it might seem like it's not much of a statement, but it is. It's important to, you know, recognize our uniqueness at other times of the year as well. Um, Saying that it cuts both ways is, it, it, yeah, it kind of does. But, you know, 
what do you do? It's, it's a choice. Hi, thanks for the, the presentation. I have a question. What do you think is the reason for uh, like the, the marginalization that happens? Um, I know that like after I graduated, um, there was, I remember reading articles about, um, about like the photo textbooks that we use, like the, the Blumenthal and, and you know, a lot of the controversy because like who they edited out or who they didn't bother to, to include. Mm -hmm. um, and I, j I just wonder, like, is the problem not just the curators, but uh, it starts way before that when those, those curators went to school as well. Right. Um, you know, they never re we never really talked a lot about, like, uh, some of the Japanese photographers before World War II um, and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, maybe the problem, at least in, uh, it's only my opinion, but maybe it, it goes a lot deeper than just, you know, wh where, where the money went to school. So to speak. Mm. So I don't. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Well, and we work with a lot of self-taught photographers as well, right? So um, it comes. I think it does come down further back in time to when we're younger. You know, what are we learning? How are we learning? You know, what schools are we going to? Um, what are we exposing ourselves to? Um, and I'm kind of speaking globally, right? Not just you know curators and and whatnot, but Right, it, we learned from our educators and you know, some folks accept the curricula that is given because something has to be given. And you know, other folks go out of their way to find various narratives of that same story. And, and I think that's you know, the part of the missing ingredient. Um, personally, I would love to see more people mentoring um, because I think mentorship offers an amazing opportunity to, to learn and expose yourself to uh, other artists. Um, you know, it's, it's complex. It's not, I mean, it's not an easy answer, but I think it's, it's definitely, um, you know, education-based in a way. And what can we do to, you know, educate ourselves? Just, you know, know that there's more than one side of the coin. There always is. You're a photographer also, correct? Yes. Did you um, think in your career you'd end up playing this role as sort of uh, director, executive director, and <laughs> um, editor, and um, advocate? Was that sort of, you know, how you ended up here? I think I, think I didn't see it in the beginning, but as a photographer, um, my work is, is documentary based. It's very much geared towards social justice and humanitarian issues. And um, I feel like, in a way, this still is social justice and, um, you know, on a, on a broader and a different level. So there is definitely a tie. Um, certainly didn't imagine. I would be here today, but I know that if it weren't for my mentors in college and, uh, and learning about how to treat your, the folks you're photographing with dignity and respect and courtesy and all those beautiful human values that you want to be treated the same way, right? How can you portray somebody if you don't Try to understand them. Try to you know figure out what's going on. So I think that very much carries over to you know what we're doing now, just trying to understand the world around us, which is so complicated. Um, but it's definitely a challenge to do everything to get other photographers ahead and trying to remain a photographer because um, they don't. I don't mix those two worlds very often. So. Have you ever been in either of them? 
there is one issue, uh, the commemorative issue, that came out over 10 years ago uh, that includes work by 70 photographers. So um, the director at the time argued with me until I caved. So I have one of my pieces in the in Nueva Luz. <laughs> I just, you know, I, to me, it's there's there's a line. You know, I'm here to do a job for other folks. So I'm not going to use the organization to promote my own work. It's it's just a personal, you know, personal thing. I think um, what was on a very <coughs> personal and positive note was how you pointed out how Rachel and Manjari, how they, they honor their heritage and mm. look to what's, what makes them special. So versus going beige, as, we were dis as you discussed before, how they were saying, no, this is who I am, and value it and show it. Sure. And, and we see how successful they are. And one of, one of the things I, w I hindsight, right, uh, that I was thinking of is uh, we do have a number of photographers that just do abstract work. You know, uh, Kunie, Japanese photographer, I could have, you know, uh, next time I should include her. You know, uh, Frank Stewart, like some of the work that we published in Nueva Luz early on, very abstract, not about his heritage. Just, it just, it's about him and his artwork, his vision, how he interprets the world around him. So, um, you know, it's, it doesn't, the work just doesn't have to be about your ethnic upbringing, history, who you are. But, you know, your, your voice as a photographer. So. Well, I think you've given us all a lot to think about. <laughs> right? Thank you very much. Thank you.